Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. You will see flash flooding conditions uh, in many parts of Florida as this thing moves through. Be prepared to be without power for a few days and having enough food and water for each person and their family. Tropical storm Elsa getting stronger, taking aim at Florida's west coast. We're live as the state braces for landfall. Right now, as I speak to you, millions of Americans are still unvaccinated and unprotected. And because of that, their communities are at risk. The White House trying to get more Americans vaccinated after missing its 4th of July goal. So how do they convince people to get their COVID shots before the Delta variant spreads even more? Plus, the president under pressure to respond to the largest ransomware attack ever. A Russian-based hacking group demanding $70 million in Bitcoin to unlock more than a million devices. We start this evening with Tropical Storm Elsa and NBC News correspondent Sam Brock, who's in the Florida Keys, uh, where we understand the rain and winds are, are about to be in full effect. But, Sam, it looks OK where you are. So tell us, what have you been seeing there today? It's been a tale of two days. Allison, good afternoon. Good to be with you. Certainly okay. this morning we had an event. There's no debating that there were wind speeds, Allison, that at some point hit 70 miles per hour in terms of the gust, sustained winds of 45 or 50 miles an hour. It was strong enough that I was physically moved from where I was standing out by the, uh, go the Straits of Florida as we were describing everything as it was coming in. Four inches of rain just by noon. Now look around me. I'm on Duval Street, which is the main hub of activity in Key West. And under normal circumstances, this would be very vibrant. You see tons of people walking around right now. Bars are back open. Restaurants are open. But in the meantime, this morning, when I was driving to our live shot, it was empty. The streets were flooded. You just don't see Key West look like that. It's certainly not for a very long period of time. But fast forward about six hours and, you know, Florida weather, the saying there, just wait a little bit and things change. And here we are. There's a little bit of lasting remnants yeah. of wind, virtually no rain at this point. But people are feeling good, certainly much better than they were earlier today when the storm swept through oh, the sure. lower keys, especially here in Key West. It was very disruptive. Sam, you've got the opposite of a typical Florida day, right? Because usually you expect some rain in the afternoon. You had the opposite. It's a little bit better in the afternoon. I have to ask you about the vacationers there. Uh, yesterday, you showed us the tough time. Exactly. You showed us the tough time people were having trying to get home from the Keys. Is the airport in Key West open and are people able to get out? So it appears to be back open. We just checked flight times. And as okay. of about 5 or 5.30 this evening, there are scheduled flights to leave. That is good news for all the folks that we spoke to yesterday who had their flights canceled. It wasn't a huge group of people, but everyone with afternoon flights and really early evening to evening flights yesterday saw them dropped. And that's the places like Miami and Chicago, Orlando, New York, Los Angeles. It flies all over. There's 24 different destinations. That was definitely paused for a period of time. All the flights this morning and early afternoon were canceled. But now it appears that things are back up and running again. And just to give you a sense of how rare this is right now in July, it has been 95 years, Allison, since a hurricane has made landfall on the west coast of Florida in July. That is about to change later today if the projections hold. And if Elsa becomes a hurricane once again with wind speeds of at least 75 miles an hour. Sam, I understand you talked to some locals there, too. What did they tell you about this uh, rare weather situation they're dealing with? And, and man, you got a lot of friends there, right? No one's more popular than the news guy when he's standing out on the street. It's amazing, by the way, just if I may, a microcosm of Florida. Only in Florida would you have someone have no awareness of where they are at all and literally stand in between you and a camera without realizing it and just stay there. Welcome to Florida. This is my life every single day. With respect to your question about how people are trying to ride this out, and yes, they are happy to be back on the streets again. One too many cocktails, if you know what I mean. Uh, what we're talking about right now, yep. though, in terms of how people are riding this out, aside from going back to the bars, <laughs> yeah, is the fact that they were kind of just giving it time and knowing that, I mean, you're seeing tropical storms all the time here. It's not unusual to see streets flood, to see winds kick up. The odd part was really just the timing of this. We spoke with a neighbor who lived next door to where we're reporting from today. Here's how she broke it down. This is an early storm. Usually we don't see this until September, end of August. 
So it's not the storm per se that's strange, it's the timing of it. The timing is a little scary, because it's early. It's, it's just the beginning of July. It's only one month into hurricane season. Here's another factoid for you, Allison. It has been more than a thousand days since there was even a hurricane warning on the west coast of Florida. Here we are again. And so it's just really important to keep a couple of safety things in mind. As the governor has pointed out, it's one thing to be prepared. It's yeah. another to make sure that you have food and water for a week because it's the power outages, really, that could be an issue. Storm surge, certainly, too. But if there are power outages, you're going to want to make sure that you have supplies. And this thing right now is barreling towards the Big Bend area of Florida and Tampa area as well. They are vulnerable, and that's where Elsa is headed at this moment. Yeah, and Sam, when you talk about food, drink, and supplies, I, I don't think you mean street beers and cocktails. Uh, so, you know, you, you want to have some more serious stuff on hand. But nothing shows us that Key West is doing a little bit better than folks having drinks on the street and walking right through your live shot. If ever there were evidence that you guys are they're doing drinking, okay. They're drinking hurricanes. You know they are. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Of course. Sam, thanks. We know that waiting for news is unbearable. The waiting, the waiting, and the waiting is unbearable. 32 people have now died in Surfside. The families of 113 others still waiting for news. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hilliard is there. Uh, Vaughn, 32 people now confirmed dead. We are in the 13th day of the search. Uh, what's the latest there today? Yeah, good afternoon, Allison. Just in about the last 90 minutes, there was a torrential downpour and strong gusts of wind here. We were told that that rescue operation was continuing. Essentially, if there was lightning, they would uh, have put a pause on that effort here. But this, by and large, you can see the rain has come to a stop here as well. But the good part of this day was that uh, outside of these last 90 minutes, there's been no other rainfall. There's been no other lightning in the area. The wind has been kept to a minimum here. This was an ideal day for these rescue crews. After that demolition on Sunday night, they were able to get in there and begin to expand their operation. About 200 individuals are actually on that pile that are part of those rescue crews. They're switching out in shifts here. Uh, and earlier today, we were told that four additional individuals were recovered uh, from the scene. But again, there's up to 117 individuals unaccounted for. I wanna let you hear uh, part of my conversation with Maggie Castro. She is one of those uh, individuals with the Florida Task Force rescue crew here. And she was commenting on the impact that these winds could have here on this operation and the hope that this storm continues to move west and largely avoid uh, because of its impact on those teams. Take a listen. When we can't use the heavy machinery, that doesn't mean that work stops. We still have smaller um, bulldozers or front end loaders that we use to remove debris. We are still working on all the areas of the pile. There is no area that's off limits now, so we've been able to work all along the pile. Allison, again, there was a plans for rain and wind throughout this entire day in just about 90 minutes worth. That's a, a, a pretty good Tuesday here in Surfside as of right now as these rescue crews frantically try to continue this recovery operation. Yeah, Yvonne, I was expecting to see it perhaps uh, in a little bit more rain and wind and glad to see that, that right now at least uh, you're not dealing with that. Uh, let's talk about what some of the crews are dealing with, though. Miami-Dade's mayor is saying they're bringing in cooling stations. It's undoubtedly hot there in July in Florida. Uh, Royal Caribbean's making a ship available for teams to rest. Uh, tell us overall how those first responders are, are holding up. They're just incredible uh, working there day in and day out. Yeah. And this is going to be a hell of a haul here. These crews are working 12-hour shifts, midnight to noon, and then another crew comes in noon to midnight here. And again, 117 potential individuals unaccounted for. There are definitely at least 70 confirmed missing individuals, officials are saying. And just a couple individuals are being recovered each day. They hope that process to be sped up. At the same time, they say they're going to continue to work deliberately through this year and not go at an excessive pace just to speed up the recovery process here. But you were mentioning some of these efforts here that are underway here to provide for those very rescue crews. And right now, it's relatively cool. But again, in the last 90 minutes, torrential down rain. And I was talking to actually Maggie, that rescue crew worker who was telling me yesterday, it was you know 90 plus degrees and very excessively humid. And she said, you can't drink enough liquid to make up for the amount that you are losing 
uh, over the course of every minute there. And that's what type of situation that these crews are working through. It changes hour to hour. They are doing incredible work in incredibly tough uh, conditions that, as you said, change hour to hour. Vaughn, uh, thanks again for your reporting today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, my friend. Nearly 160 million people will be fully vaccinated by the end of the week, according to the White House. But President Biden thinks we could do better. Today, he's launching a new push to get more COVID shots in arms. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Mike, President Biden's laying out five focus areas here. Uh, what are they? Well, Allison, you mentioned that number, 160 million Americans fully vaccinated by the end of the week. That was one of the two goals that the president had set for the 4th of July that they didn't meet. And so we were wondering how the White House would be responding, whether they'd be setting some new goals going forward. And what they offered was this five point plan really for how they're going to continue to try to keep this vaccine push going. The first is targeted door to door, almost campaign like uh, trying to target those who haven't been vaccinated to find them and really offer them in person. Secondly, they want to make sure vaccines are available at primary care physicians. The idea being when you go to a doctor's office for a typical checkup, that they'll, that'll be an option that's almost too easy to turn up if it's there. Similarly, they want to have more vaccinations available at pediatricians, especially as we head toward back to school time. They think this is going to be an area where we see some of those younger age groups that have been more reluctant to get uh, a vaccine shoot way up, especially once the FDA approves the vaccine for even younger and younger Americans. They also want to make vaccines available for workers. And so that includes uh, having them on job sites. One of the things the White House has already been talking about is trying to offer paid time off for employees so that they can take the time to go get a vaccine. Well, even better would be having them at the workplace of four workers. And then lastly, you see it there expanding the mobile units that have been really successful in the White House's view of bringing vaccines to those who might not be able to travel on their own uh, to get them. This is sort of the difference of an air war that the White House launched early on with those mass vaccination mm -hmm. sites at stadiums and the like to really going door to door at a very much of a ground game. Uh, that's the how that's how you make the difference between 67.1 percent mm -hmm. and getting well over 70 percent as the White House needs to do. And Mike, look, there's a real delicate balance here, right? We're trying to celebrate progress against the pandemic. We know the White House wants to, to have that as part of its focus. But you also have to warn about this Delta variant, which is becoming increasingly dangerous. Uh, how is the president uh, figuring out that balancing act? Well, as you said, trying to convince people to get their shots. Well, this really is a shift, isn't it, Allison? Remember, just a month ago, we were talking yeah. about offering free beers, lottery tickets, <laughs> uh, and, you know, other sort of incentives yeah. to try to convince people to get vaccinated. Well, now there's a very different approach, which is a warning, a stark warning about the consequences of not being vaccinated. Take a listen to how the president presented this just a few hours ago. In today's briefing, we discussed how the Delta variant is already responsible for half of all cases in many parts of this country. It seems to me it should cause everybody to think twice. And it should cause reconsideration, especially in young people who may have thought that they didn't have to be vaccinated, didn't have to worry about it, and didn't have to do anything about it up to now. But the good news is that our vaccinations are highly effective. Earlier this afternoon, Allison, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was asked, is there frustration in the White House, even among uh, the president himself, about the fact that the answer to this Delta variant and other strains that are out there is so easy, so accessible, uh, having the vaccine that some people are just refusing to do? She said, we're in government. We don't have the ability to be frustrated or to be upset. We're just going to continue to try to do what we can to convince people that this is the right thing to do. Uh, Mike, we got to talk infrastructure. The president heading to Illinois tomorrow to talk about it. What do you know about his visit? So this is interesting as we start even now thinking ahead to the midterm election campaign. Whenever the president travels, I can't help but notice, as is the case with this visit tomorrow, he's heading to a swing district represented by a Democrat in Congress uh, who was one of those who first won office in 2018 to help give the House Democrats uh, the majority in the House. And so he's going to be visiting the district of Lauren Underwood. She is actually a registered nurse, uh, and he's going to be focusing on some of the health related benefits of both the bipartisan uh, compromise that he's reached on infrastructure, uh, but especially to continue to push, as we expect the White House to do even more over the coming weeks, uh, some of the other elements he's proposed in the American Families Plan, uh, including and potentially uh, significantly expansion of some of the Affordable Care Act and the child tax credit that many Americans are going to start seeing in their direct deposit in the next few weeks, Allison. 
All right, Mike Memley, with all the different pushes coming from the White House this week, thank you so much. Thank you. NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce is back. We missed her over the holiday weekend. She's got the latest headlines from NBCNews.com, and we are so thrilled to see you. Simone, how you doing? Hey, Allison, so great to see you, too. All right, let's get started here. And we are going to start in Kabul, where the Taliban has paraded containers full of weapons and military hardware seized from the Afghan military. Now, it comes as American forces withdraw from the country. Sky News telling us the weaponry includes 900 guns, 30 light tactical vehicles and 20 army pickup trucks. And over in Germany, government security officials making more than 750 arrests and seizing large amounts of drugs after gaining access to extensive chat data from encrypted cell phones. The investigation began in April 2020 and focused on data from users of the provider EncroChat who were involved in the illegal drug trade. And Britney Spears' longtime manager, Larry Rudolph, has actually resigned, saying it is in the pop star's best interest, given her intention to retire. Rudolph says it's been over two and a half years since he'd last spoken with Britney. He sent his resignation letter to Spears' co-conservators, her father, Jamie Spears, and jo Jamie, Mon excuse me, Jody Montgomery. And Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson on the Today Show this morning saying he can't wait to rocket into space later this week. Now, Branson's space tourism company Virgin Galactic announced last week that it would attempt to launch its next space flight on July 11th. And that's nine days ahead of Jeff, Jeff Bezos, who plans to launch with his own company, Blue Origin. So quite a tight space race there. And an update in a story that we've been following here at NBC News, the Pulitzer Prize winning black investigative journalist Nicole Hannah Jones, known for her creation of the 1619 Project at The New York Times, announcing she won't be joining the faculty at the University of North Carolina. Instead, she'll be accepting a chaired professorship at Howard University. Now, this comes after a long dispute over whether UNC would grant her a lifetime faculty appointment, sparking weeks of controversy that you've probably been hearing about online all over social media. Allison, I'll send it back to you and I'll see you in a little bit. All right, Simone, we'll see you next hour. Six months ago today, hundreds of pro-Trump rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol. The Justice Department still looking for about 300 of them. The DOJ arresting and charging more than 500 people so far. That January 6th attack exposing deep partisan divisions in our government. Today, Speaker Pelosi still waiting to see if Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy will name anyone to the select committee to investigate what happened that day. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joining me now. Leanne, the acting U.S. Capitol Police Chief talking today about enhanced security around the Capitol complex. Uh, what's going on there? What are some of the changes? Hey, Allison, on the six month anniversary, uh, acting chief Yogananda Pittman is outlining some of the changes that she says the department has made. This comes from a series of reports from the Capitol Police Inspector General, from uh, flash reports from the Homeland Security and Rules Committee in the Senate. She says some of those changes include uh, more training, including riot training to the Civil Disobedience Unit, uh, also uh, more communication coordination, especially on intelligence matters. She writes in this letter that throughout the last six months, the United States Capitol Police has been working around the clock with our congressional stakeholders to support our officers, enhance security around the Capitol complex, and pivot towards the intelligence-based protective agency so, Allison, there's a lot of changes that are and uh, that are being demanded of Capitol Police, and they are rushing to make those changes. But one of the most uh, critical ones is to uh, increase the force, uh, hire more Capitol Police officers, and that is something that has remained a major challenge for them. Leanne, we mentioned the DOJ is still trying to identify about 300 or so remaining rioters. What issues are they running into? Yeah, well, there's a couple things. Uh, they've already uh, talked about 550 who they have uh, charged. There's up to 800 people who are expected to perhaps face charges. It's been very difficult for the Department of Justice to find some of these people. And then they're also making the announcements of these arrests and charges when they see fit. So there could perhaps be some people who have been arrested and charged already that we just don't know about. 
But so those are the two reasons why、uh, there seems to be some outstanding people who are wanted、mm-hmm. in this in January six thousand. All right, Leanne. Let's talk about the Select Committee. We know Speaker Pelosi already picked eight people, including one Republican, Liz Cheney. But we're still waiting on Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. He has five picks. He hasn't named anyone. Do you have any idea what his next move will be? Is he taking a sweet time here, or is, or is he just not going to name anyone at all? We don't know, Allison. He hasn't said definitively that he's、okay. going to name anyone. He said last week that he would announce the news when he has it. I'm talking to Republican sources who say that McCarthy and his team have been very silent about what their strategy is and what their plans are going to be. But I will say that the five Republicans that he does choose, if he does choose to name anyone, is going to be scrutinized. He has a choice: does he? Name Republicans who want to take the investigation seriously, or does he name Republicans who have denied January 6th or gaslit January 6th? And so,、uh, you know, we'll see which route he takes. But we know that he's under a lot of pressure for who he chooses and when he chooses, if he chooses. Allison. Yeah, yeah, all of it. The pressure is on. We'll see what decisions he makes, if any. Leanne, thanks a million. I received an update from our national security team this morning. It appears to have caused minimal damage to U.S. businesses, but we're still gathering information to the full extent of the attack. And I'm going to have more to say about this in the next several days. Growing pressure on the White House to respond to a massive ransomware attack. Russian hackers claiming responsibility. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delaney and joining me now. So Ken, this is the largest ransomware attack in history. It's just three weeks after President Biden warned Vladimir Putin about Russian cyber attacks at their summit in Geneva. It sure looks like that warning fell on deaf ears. Yeah, it sure does, Allison. So this group、uh, known as R Evil has taken responsibility for this attack. They are. Russian-speaking and believed to be based in Russia, although the Biden administration said today that they haven't formally、uh, attributed this attack as having come from Russian territory. And the, and the Biden, as you saw from the president there, they were very measured in how they talked about this today. But I asked a prominent cybersecurity expert whether that warning that President Biden gave to Putin at the summit in Geneva whether that had any impact. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. It's clear that it has not yet had impact. We don't know if that's because the message was not received. President Putin decided to ignore it, or maybe he just didn't feel like this should be a top priority issue. Maybe he thought that this would be handled over time in negotiations. But we don't have time here. We need to act now. We need to demand that these individuals responsible for this particular hack get arrested. The key gets turned over to the businesses that need to decrypt their data. Now you heard the president. He didn't say anything of the sort publicly. But what Dmitry Alperovitch and other people are saying is that they hope that privately, behind the scenes, in these talks that are ongoing between U.S. and Russian officials over cyber, that the U.S. administration is making clear to the Russians that this stuff needs to stop, Allison. All right. So, to, to the effect of getting this stuff to stop, Ken, the hackers won seventy million dollars in Bitcoin to end this attack. The president telling reporters over the weekend he's directed the full resources of the government to investigate.、Uh, do we know specifically what that means and what other options the White House has here? Not just dealing with this particular attack, but trying to shut these down in general. Yes. Well, there, there's options, of course, on the defensive side, which is to try to shore up. Our defenses and cybersecurity here, but this was such an insidious attack、mm-hmm. on the supply chain where a trusted IT company was breached and then spread the malware. It's really、yeah. hard to、uh, understand how these small businesses ever could have stopped that, right? So the other side of it is is deterring the attacker. And what what many people believe needs to happen is that the Biden administration needs to raise the cost to Russia for allowing these cyber criminals to operate with impunity on their territory, because that's what's going on here. Our evil is not part of the Russian state, but they are allowed to attack the West from Russian territory, and Russia does nothing about it. They don't arrest these people. They don't stop them.、Yeah. And so, yes, there are options that Biden has, up to and including a military cyber attack against, for example, these our evil networks, which there is precedent for that. They've done that kind of thing before. But it's a really dicey proposition, Allison, because nobody is more vulnerable in cyberspace than the United States of America, and Russia can hurt us. Yeah. Probably more than we can hurt Russia, and that's always in the calculation of any U.S. president when they try to figure out what to do on, on the cyber front.
Yeah, Ken, it seems like there are options, but maybe no great ones. Uh, thanks so much for reporting it. We'll see what happens. You bet. Thanks. So what does the average ransomware attack cost? Twice as much these days. In 2020, the average recovery cost was Seven hundred and sixty one thousand dollars in 2020, 2021, rather, it's nearly one point nine million companies are now taking out cyber insurance to protect themselves. But does this new industry have enough money to cover all the risk? NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward reports. Mecklenburg County in North Carolina used to worry about things like hurricanes and being overshadowed by UNC Chapel Hill. But now add ransomware to the list. They learned about that one the hard way when a 2017 attack forced county officials to basically go back in time. They started doing business on paper. Um, it took a little bit of a transition. Certainly things were slower. Uh, information was not readily available because we did take um, all of our servers offline. But they'd been trained for this by their insurance company. We had walked through scenarios with our cyber liability insurance carrier to say, OK, in the event that this happens, what do we do next? Who do we call? And um, they were very resourceful. Companies are increasingly paying for insurance against cyber attacks. Now, typical insurers don't train you to fight fire or to drive better, but cyber insurance companies do more than just pay for losses. We are an insurance company that has a dedicated uh, forensics and instant response team that's available to our customers. Uh, it's included as part of their policy. I don't think there's any segment of the economy that we don't insure. But as more and more organizations buy protection, the pool of risk may eventually outgrow what insurers can pay. Research from PCS, a Vera Risk company, found that approximately 500 companies pay for at least $100 million each in protection. If even a few of them are attacked in a given year, that wipes out the estimated $1.4 billion they're paying the insurance industry. If even two of the top 40 clients are attacked, the ones paying for at least $500 million in protection, well, there goes 50 years of earnings for insurers assuming current rates. Almost half the insurance limit out there goes to this collection of companies, and the other half goes to a, a massive, you know, group of, you know, smaller players with smaller amounts of insurance. Ransomware demands currently average more than $170,000 per attack, a big jump from even two years ago. Maybe the price will stabilize. When you go to the grocery store, what you're witnessing is the sustainability of pricing for the things on the shelf. You know, if you charge too much for oregano, people are going to stop buying it. You can port that thinking to ransomware. If it gets to the point where ransom is either too expensive to pay, either existentially relative to a company's holdings, or because it's cheaper just to you know, pull from backup, well, then the price will come down or, or the market will recede. But the problem here is that the market is still growing. And as new victims without insurance keep paying ransom, attackers will keep raising their prices. This may explain why federal officials are urging companies not to pay. Paying of ransomware only exacerbates and accelerates this problem. You are encouraging the bad actors when that happens. But as insurers struggle to find enough money to cover the risk, they're also training their clients to perhaps stop the threat before it drowns the market. In order to qualify for insurance, um, you shouldn't be doing the types of things that are going to make you a target of a, of a criminal actor. Mecklenburg hasn't been attacked again. We do a lot of proactive measures to make sure that we're prepared. We don't ever want to be attacked again. Once is enough. Once is enough, absolutely. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. Today, it's all about the hottest new housing trends and a new spin on work from home. Wouldn't it be nice to have an office with a view, one that you change every few weeks? According to a recent study, nearly 11 million Americans have figured out how to do just that. They're called digital nomads, turning the pandemic's work from home model into an opportunity to travel. Today's show anchor Chanel Jones dives into this new way of living.
where are you guys? <laughs> we are in Tamarindo, Costa Rica. After this, we're heading to Iceland and then Italy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good life. Yeah. That's uh, not a virtual yeah. background behind Jeremy and Kelsey Sunny. The couple deciding a year ago to uproot their lives in Denver, Colorado, and travel the world with their two-year-old son, Emmett. Good job! The family of three hopping from one vacation rental to the next. A pandemic housing trend opening the door for digital nomads, remote workers like Jeremy, who combine working from home with wanderlust. How would you describe what being a digital nomad is all about? Basically, we live pretty normal lives, but we change locations every four to six weeks. It's just like living life on your terms, but balancing, of course, the needs of working and everything else at the same time. Do you find just whether it's an Airbnb or different house rentals, how do you do that? So far, it's been almost entirely Airbnbs. It sounds like it's this really extravagant, exotic, expensive lifestyle, and it's really not. Honestly, most of the places we stay, the rent is cheaper than what we paid in Denver. A recent study revealing the number of Americans who identify as digital nomads has gone through the roof, climbing almost 50% from 2019. The dramatic rise attributed to the seismic shift to remote work during COVID, which inspired the adventurous to hit escape on a traditional home office. Instead, turning to vacation rental sites like Airbnb, Verbo, and others to help them mix business with pleasure stateside for some. So my goal is to see as many national parks as I can. And abroad for others. Our third anniversary is going to be in September this year. And probably somewhere international because we this Friday actually we are leaving to Europe. While Airbnb says the percentage of stays 28 days or longer has nearly doubled since 2019, Verbo reports a similar spike with the demand for stays of at least three weeks increasing more than 30%. But no matter where you look, experts advise nomads to pay close attention to the amenities of each rental before booking. So make sure, number one, that they have Wi-Fi. Read the reviews. There are some places where air conditioning is not included. And there are some places where having a dishwasher is considered an amenity, but it's not an essential item. Has a blankie. While the Sunnies say they do keep a short list of must-haves when choosing their next destination, ultimately for them, home is where the blankie is. <laughs> Picture sure the day when you're gonna have to like, I don't know, settle. Ah! Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? Not yet. <laughs> I'm not ready for it yet. But there's some days where I'm like, it would be nice if we had this thing or that thing, or we didn't have to pack everything up and put it into four suitcases. Talk to me about what your hopes for Emmett. It's just kind of this spirit of adventure. He was a little baby. I would always just like tell him like, be brave, be kind. And I feel like that that's what we're living that lifestyle. Well, some people traveled the world this pandemic. Others set down roots. COVID setting off a home buying frenzy. And you wouldn't believe how many of those purchases happened sight unseen. Now some of those people have buyer's remorse. So what do they do? Here's NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule. Desiree Davis is a first-time home buyer in Canton, Ohio. This is our second-story bathroom. Um, obviously, we haven't been able to use it. And since she's moved in... This is the kitchen sink. Doesn't work. It's been anything but home sweet home. There was sewage coming up out of this drain pipe. After being outbid four times on other houses, Davis decided to forego the home inspection in order to guarantee she'd be able to move in wasn't probably the smartest idea. But if you look at the house, it's a pretty house. We just kind of got duped. We really got duped. New what words. has been yeah. the worst part of this ordeal? Oh my God, I, I cry every day. I literally cry every day. Every single day something happens. And Davis isn't alone. According to Bankrate, 64% of millennials, 45% of Gen X, and 33% of baby boomers regret their home purchases. For reasons like overpaying for their property, high maintenance costs, poor location, or wrong house size. A product of a highly competitive housing market during the pandemic, buyers are making offers sight unseen and waiving contingencies to win bidding wars. This house looked great online, but I should have actually seen, you know, seen it in person and really 
taken more time to decide on what kind of lifestyle we wanted to have when we came here. I have multiple raccoons. With everything from a raccoon infestation in the chimney to a septic tank that wasn't supposed to be there, Davis is fed up. I'm really just in, I'm just stuck now. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in this house. Everyone get inspections done, no matter what. And it should be against the law. It really should. It should be a requirement. Davis hopes future homeowners heed her cautionary tale so their dream homes don't become money pits. Stephanie Rule, NBC News. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. They are escaping a number of conditions there, violence and persecution in their home countries. They are speaking out against laws that they feel would make it harder for Texas voters to cast their ballot. There's excitement that we are now turning the corner. We heard the mask mandate and mask guidance coming from the CDC earlier today. We have a team of correspondents covering this breaking story for us today. Well, this is a heck of a cast. Andy Cohen, welcome to the Six Minute Marathon. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. 400 years ago, my ancestor founded our town. Anyone see the resemblance? I am the steward of my family's legacy. And you have a museum. You're going to get yours too. The only native artifacts in here are those bags. <laughs> There's something happening in that town. This is a story about stories. Damn, the podcasting voice is very manipulative. Death threats, harassment, and arrest. The debate over critical race theory boiling over in a Virginia school district. A school board meeting spiraling out of control over a subject education officials say isn't even being taught there. And it's happening all across the country. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson has the story. I actually attended my first PTA meeting in this very room. In the last 19 years, Brenda Sheraton has gone from concerned parent to school board chairwoman in Loudoun County, Virginia. But she says what began as a dream job has turned into a nightmare. Don't teach our kids guilt for their failings. Over the past several weeks, Sheraton says she has received nearly a dozen letters at her home, hundreds of emails daily, and voicemails like these. You are a disgusting piece of shit, Ms. Sheraton. You know your home address is on the internet, don't you? That could be a little scary. Stupid, fat blogger. Anger, born out of controversy around transgender rights and critical race theory, the decades-old academic study of racism and inequality. Does the Loudoun County School District teach critical race theory? It does not. Are you all considering teaching critical race theory? We are not. It would be inappropriate because it is theory based in master level and doctor doctoral level education. In recent months, Loudoun County has become the latest hotspot in the battle over the contentious subject matter. The school district, which was among the last in the country to desegregate, has gone from being predominantly white to majority minority over the last decade. Last fall, they began implementing changes after an internal audit and subsequent state investigation found that their policies harmed black and Latino students and called on the district to fix the discriminatory disparate impact identified to ensure equal opportunity for each student. The district implemented new diversity training for staff, banned the Confederate flag on clothing, and revised policies for responding to racial slurs and hate speech. We have an equity initiative. We are talking about our students' experiences. We are focusing on making our marginalized students feel welcome and affirmed, all of them. Still, 
Many parents in the Northern Virginia County are now rallying against what they say is critical race theory. A Facebook group created by community members to combat what they view as misinformation about the district's equity and diversity push only made matters worse. The Facebook group called anti-racist parents of Loudoun County is accused of targeting parents who are anti-CRT. Last month, things took a turn. I am disgusted by your bigotry. A school board meeting where new state mandated policies for transgender students was being discussed descended into chaos, resulting in one arrest. Uh, this is an unlawful arrest. I have a first amendment right. I have never been afraid to be in my community. I have never thought twice about going anywhere in Loudoun or anywhere in my community. And I stop and think twice now. Across the country, similar stories are emerging amid anger over mask wearing, critical race theory, transgender rights, and more. But in a state like Virginia, a former Republican stronghold now solidly blue, Sheraton worries some concerned parents are being used as pawns. I believe this started with parents who were angry, frustrated, full of anxiety, wanting to do what was best for their students, and it has snowballed to something that I'm not even sure they understand. The flashpoints, some of them are weekly, and something dies down, so somebody lights another fire. Who's igniting these <laughs> fires? I think it is polit politically motivated. When Virginia was purple, it was very important in national elections. And so when Virginia really tipped blue, it started to affect that as well. When you change the dynamic in Northern Virginia, you change the dynamic in the state. Governor's race. As Sheraton continues to bear the brunt of the harassment in Loudoun, she says she won't back down, even as she faces a recall effort. The work we're doing is important. It is worth every email I have to read and every phone call I get. It is worth it. Priscilla joins me now. And Priscilla, my gosh, this story is just bl mind blowing. I got a couple of questions for you. L let's start with what we're seeing there. The Washington Post calling loud in the face of the nation's culture wars, thanks to some of the shifting demographics that you mentioned uh, in your reporting. So let's talk a little bit more about what we're seeing, not just there, but across America, whether we're talking about critical race theory or rights for trans students. Yeah, you know, Allison, my colleague Tyler Kincaid has been all over this, tracking these incidents around the country. And what we're seeing is that Loudoun County really mirrors what is happening in other places. These cultural flashpoints erupting at school board meetings and going from zero to 100 with these local leaders caught in the middle. And what the, is really interesting about this conversation around critical race theory is that NBC News has obtained a survey of teachers nationwide, which shows them saying they are not being pushed to teach critical race theory. They are not being required to teach that in their classrooms. But yet and still, we see these officials receiving harassment and threats around that issue. Allison. So, Priscilla, I have to ask you more about Brenda Sheridan, the school board chairwoman that you spoke with there. I mean, she could be recalled, even though she says her school district isn't even teaching critical race theory. Uh, any updates there on that situation? Yeah. So I did ask Brenda Sheraton about that recall effort. She tells me that this is her community. She has no intention to resign. She plans to continue to serve out the remaining two and a half years of her uh, of her of, of her term. And that is because she feels like the work that the district is doing around equity is incredibly important for students and their futures. Allison. All right, Priscilla, let's hope they can maybe have these conversations, but with a little bit more civility, no more fights breaking out uh, or threats uh, at school board meetings. Unbelievable reporting there. Thank you. Absolutely. Ankle monitors and house arrest on the rise during COVID, but are they effective? Researchers say the surveillance devices hurt people trying to get their life on track after prison, and there's no evidence the technology is rehabilitative. NBCNews.com tech investigations reporter April Glazer here with me now. April, uh, so how are, if you could tell us, how are ankle monitors making matters worse for people in the prison system? 
Sure. So what's happening is even before people are convicted, as they await trial, they've been put on ankle monitor increasingly. And then also as people were getting let out during COVID, as prisons became hotspots for coronavirus, they were getting put on an ankle monitor. And researchers I spoke to who study redictivism and, and who look at this matter closely said that they actually pull people, de pull people deeper into the prison system because it's so easy to get small violations and infractions for charging your device late. There's a certain time during the day you're supposed to charge it um, for stepping outside of the tight GPS restricted area you're allowed to be in, like to take out your trash, like stepping outside your house. Those little infractions actually pull people into the system often and cause people to get taken in uh, to court again. So there's, they say that, that these monitors, rather than helping people kind of get their lives back on track, actually pull people deeper in. Uh, in reading your reporting, you have some really interesting history here. Ankle monitors created in the 60s for juvenile offenders. You interviewed a young woman who was put on probation back in high school for charges linked to a car theft. What did she tell you about her personal experience? Yeah, she said she was in high school and uh, and was put on an ankle monitor after being put in juvenile hall. And throughout the course of being in an ankle monitor on and off throughout an entire year, she was pulled back into juvenile hall multiple times because uh, she was lit, like one minute late for charging her device. For example, you're supposed to charge it between 7 and 9 p.m. Well, sometimes the bus is late. If you have a job, uh, you know, you don't always get off right at the exact time. And if you're not there to to plug in your ankle monitor right at that time, you can get an infraction. She said that she um, had a violation threatened on her for stepping outside of her grandma's house when there was a fire, for example. So, you know, it's, it's the strictness of these devices that are supposed to, again, apparently help people kind of monitor their behavior or rather help probation officers monitor people's behavior. You know, all of these infractions add up and, and, and kind of kind of ready them to, to have more violations, make it more easy to break the law and then kind of yeah. land them back in jail. If the objective here, April, is to keep people out of jail, are there other maybe better alternatives? Well, sure. You know, the the researchers that I spoke to who, again, look at people who are put on ankle monitors, which has seen a sharp increase during the pandemic as people were racing to or as judges were racing to get people out of prison where they were catching coronavirus. So they were putting them on ankle monitor instead. Um, the researcher I spoke to said most of the people who are put on ankle monitor, they're almost out of prison to begin with. So didn't have much time left or uh, they are actually awaiting trial. So they haven't actually been charged of anything. Or they're put on ankle monitor in the juvenile sense for stuff that wouldn't have actually put them in juvenile hall or in jail to begin with. So researchers I spoke to said that, you know, instead of putting someone in ankle monitor or putting them, uh, you know, behind bars, an alternative is, is freedom and just kind of having a, a very strong conversational relationship with the probation officer, because it's not like the ankle monitor is going to ensure somebody gets back to court. Sometimes human connection can make all the difference. April, thanks for being with us. Thank you. They served on the front lines, but now they can't find work. Veterans who were once military medics having trouble transitioning into civilian health care jobs. NBC News Now host Aaron Gilchrist shows us how the military is trying to change that. Eric Dodson spent 11 years in the U.S. Navy trained as a hospital corpsman. I would see someone make a differential diagnosis, make a treatment plan, execute that treatment plan. As an enlisted sailor, Dotson's job included everything from daily clinical rounds and assisting with surgeries to working a mass casualty incident during a tour with Marines in Afghanistan. And it was, hey, we have like 20 people coming in, take care of some, like find someone to take care of them. After his military service, Dotson even volunteered as a registered nurse at a COVID field hospital in New York. And my badge even said RN. And once that was over, because the mission had finished, I was applying for jobs as an ER tech and being told I wasn't qualified. Or did anyone ask about your, your work experience, your life experience? A lot of it was very much, hey, this is an impressive resume. We love this. We'd love to have you. But, you know, you just don't have the right certifications. After years of military medical experience, Dodson says he left the Navy with nothing to show he could do advanced medical work. So it's hard to have that skill set and that experience and then to go back to being what's effectively an EMT where, you know, you can't do any advanced skills. So I have all this skill and knowledge and training and it seems like it's just gone to waste. 
Dodson's problem is not unique. Dan Goldenberg runs the Call of Duty endowment. So at a time of great need for healthcare workers, we're turning away some of the nation's most qualified, experienced healthcare workers. The endowment funds nonprofits that help veterans find new careers after the military. It took a look at their placement data. And we found out that half of the veterans who are medics and corpsmen who came to them asking for job placement help and wanted to work in the healthcare industry were not getting hired there. Goldenberg says Army medics and Navy corpsmen have training similar to that of civilian EMTs. He says his organization discovered only a handful of states have clear pathways from military health care to civilian health care jobs. And you're confronted with these bewildering regulations. Um, and, and sometimes a lot of these folks just give up they, and they find other careers, which is a real shame. The U.S. military is aware of this problem and a few years ago opened the medical education and training campus here at Fort Sam Houston. All of the enlisted personnel who are trained as medics and corpsmen come here. They get the same training and they get certifications that they can use in the civilian world. In the past, a medic will just be a medic even if they had three, if they had three years of experience or 20 years of experience. If they did not have any type of certification, which the, the military did not require at the time, they would not be able to get a job doing anything in a hospital. Colonel Richard V. Real is the campus's dean of academics and an experienced physician assistant. Over time, we've realized that it's better if we can provide each individual soldier, sailor, and airman with something that they can take out to the civilian community once they have finished serving their country in the military. The military branches stopped separate medical training, and starting in 2011, all student corpsmen, medics, dental assistants, and radiologists come here. Of the 48 medical programs at the school, the Army Combat Medic and Navy Hospital Corpsman programs are the largest. We watched sailors in the corpsman program hone their skills on mannequins and each other. And we were in the room as soldiers trained in a mass casualty simulation. Chaos around them. And here we train them to be able to cut through all that, stay focused on their job, and perform the job that they have at hand, which is to save that life. The skills, including calm under pressure, transfer to civilian medical care, says Villarreal. And now the military provides paperwork that transfers to. We give them certifications, licensure, registrations, things that they can use once they leave the service. The campus also now works with several colleges and universities to make sure many trainees here pick up college credits. They at least have a pathway using the, one of these bridge programs to attain a degree. And as we know, the degree will, will make them more marketable on the outside to be able to get a job. The military shifting to help more on the front end. The Call of Duty endowment donated a million dollars in May to help medic and corpsman vets find jobs, to raise awareness about their plight, and to get the attention of the people who make the rules. You know, grass is opportunity to make it easier for, for medics and corpsmen who are veterans to come into the healthcare industry. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.